Hi, this is Lynn Hunter, L-L-Y-N-H-U-N-T-E-R. Um, I'm a freelance illustrator and storyboard artist for animation. And today we're going to be painting the letter D, Deinonychus, from an animal alphabet I'm working on. This one I'm doing for my uh, little niece, uh, Penelope. She's only one years old right now, so she won't really understand the dinosaurs until maybe she gets to be about like three or four. Um, it's funny, her uh, older brother Gunner right now is getting my ape bet, but he's enjoying the uh, dino bet because uh, basically even though it's for Penelope, he's kind of getting, he's kind of getting two alphabets just because she's too little to understand what they are at the moment. Um, I got five little cousins slash niece and nephews that I've been doing a variety of these um, letters for. And this particular one is, like I said, this is the Dinobet and it's going to my little niece Cynthia. We're going to be using a variety of color. I'm, I'm mixing primarily earth tones in my palette right now. This is a little bit of um, raw umber and sienna combined. I'm going to make the rock that the dinosaur is climbing on more to the gray side. And what I'll do is um, gray is a little bit, um, this is a warm gray because I've added a little bit of uh, burnt umber to it. So this is just basically burnt umber, a little bit of sepia, and some Payne's gray to get um, an interesting, shall I say, an interesting gray rather than, say if you took black and just added water to a lamp black or Mars black. Um, black is a color too. I don't care what anybody says. I, I work with both black and white in my paintings. Normally if I'm doing a watercolor I use primarily the white of the paper as the white of the painting because let's face it um, that's that's the traditional way to do watercolor and because you're uh, working in a transparent medium that's a good way to go to get your whites for the most part but there's going to be that time when you really need to either pick out your whites and by picking out your whites you you'll you can literally use an exacto knife or a scalpel blade to pick out your whites from your color and take the the paint down to the paper because most watercolor paper is pretty thick the type of watercolor paper i always recommend you use at least um, 150 pound or 300 gram watercolor paper just because uh, a thick watercolor paper you can always scrape away if you've got a mistake you can scrape away the mistake with an, a, either a, a razor blade exacto knife blade some very sharp blade you can scrape away the paper and it you won't you'll be able to um, use an eraser to repair the paper and you don't have to worry about uh, the damage looking like it's been there. I mean, you can you can take the damage away with an eraser, uh, so that uh, nobody will ever know that you made a mistake and you scraped it away. You literally scrape scrape away the paper in order or the fibers on the paper in order to to fix your mistakes. Um, I've got one down here that. Uh, I've scraped away and basically I'll cover up again with pen when I go over this in the end we're painting in with uh, the watercolor it will cover over these pen lines with a little bit of pigment uh, I've used ballpoint pen on the initial drawing on this so it's more or less um, uh, it kind of works like in a resist because it's a petroleum distillate is your the base of your original drawing or the my original drawing the uh, it works kind of like if you have, when you're in kindergarten and you did crayon resist and you did you drew drew in crayon and the wax pushes the the water and the pigment away the ballpoint pen kind of does the same thing so that you can paint over it and basically the pen for the most part comes through the transparent quality of the uh, watercolor better 
than if you were say working in pencil it comes through darker however when I am done with any watercolor painting I will go over the pen work again just to crisp in the lines and wherever you you've used the watercolor where you've got heavier pigments like especially the yellow and orange have a tendency to be very um, heavy pigments a lot some of the earth tones such as uh, um, Sienna's more dye even though it, it's a very earth tone where your earth tones lay down pigment uh, a little bit heavier so that when you get done um, you can the the lines will be darker and cleaner if you go over the pen lines again after you have finished the painting you don't have to do it it's just one of my preferences um, and I, I'm also, I mean, you can tell, I, I do a bit of a sloppy line in the beginning. And so that when I go back afterwards, it cleans up the line and makes it look better. And it, what we're doing right now um, with this color, I'm going pretty much the same color over and over again, just to get texture in the rock. As I'm filling it in, you'll note I'm not filling it in like in one big area. I've been kind of dabbing it in here and there and here and there. And I'm adding... Um, a little bit of uh, burnt sienna or sorry not burnt sienna but burnt umber into it um, as I go along like right now to give it some warmth in various areas to make it so it's not just like I'm going over all in one color when you um, each time I dab over the value you can tell it gets a little darker and a little darker and a little darker but also to give it some interest the I'm playing a little bit of um, even though the, the the gray that I've used is a warm gray by throwing in a little bit of the the burnt umber I'm getting an even warmer gray and then I think probably I'm gonna throw in a little bit of purple shadow there when I get done and um, what I find too is it it all depends on where I'm at when I get done with the painting what color of shadows I throw in. I have a tendency to like purple shadows because purple goes dark very, very fast. You got to be really careful when you are painting with purple or any violet hue because it, it's a very dark hue and as you're painting with it, it will go fa dark really fast. So if you're trying to, to just get a hint of purple in something, um, you might want to keep your paper towel handy to blot it away and then you, you'll get a lighter value of purple where you want it. So we're, we're just about done with the rocks here. And I'm, I haven't really decided, um, I, I'm thinking I'm going to do him um, gray with some accents that are Dononicus itself. But I'm kind of, right now I'm doing the background first so that I can figure out, hmm, what do I want my Deinonychus to be? Because when it comes to dinosaurs, uh, we really don't know what color they were. We, all we've got for dinosaurs is we have fossilized bone. And we can treat it like any kind of skeleton that you'd find in forensics, where you'd cover the, the um, skeleton with skin, and you imagine it covered with skin and then you can imagine what the animal like looked like. And the problem is is that with a lot of dinosaurs in the past they had just bone fragments. When I was reading up on the Deinonychus, we've been very very fortunate that we've we found lots more of their their um, particular skeletons and bones. Um, most of the um, Deinonychuses were have Deinonychuses, isn't that a a fun one to say. All dinosaur names, as far as I'm concerned, are difficult and fun to say because I'm not sure if, if it's Latin or Greek. I have to study a little bit more up on my dinosaurs. I've been out of the dinosaur community for a while. I used to do lots of dinosaurs early on in my illustration career, and I'm just getting back into it. And there's been so many new discoveries in dinosaurs, and they finally have decided to say, Oh yeah, that that uh, birds are definitely descendants of dinosaurs, rather than, you know, saying, oh yeah, they just totally all died out. No, um, birds are descendants of dinosaurs, and that's why you'll find that a lot of dinosaurs have bird-like qualities. They've also believed now that 
many of the dinosaurs had feathers. Deinonychus is one of those that they believe um, had feathers. They haven't. They've um, found um, like the indentations for feathers on Velociraptors, which are very close to Deinonychus, but are found in China, or found in the Mongolian areas where they've they've found more of those kinds of discoveries. Originally, Deinonychus had um, it was. Glu- put in the genus of Velociraptor, but it has since been given its own um, genus. So um, they're, they're close, from what I understand, they're closely related, but Deinonychus had a little bit of a thicker skull, um, which means um, probably easier for tearing apart meat. Um, it had teeth in the skull. But it's also, they believe, that it was feathered. And if you look at its body, especially with the, the front claws, you can see, um, um, if you've, you've seen Archaeopteryx, it has a very similar um, kind of foot pattern to Archaeopteryx. And these guys were uh, in the early Cretaceous, from what I understand, um, and lived about... Uh, was it 100, 110 million years ago? Let's see here. Um, and uh, they were um, the particular um, studies they've done with them in paleontology. They were the uh, dinosaur that gave the idea that dinosaurs were actually warm-blooded animals rather than cold-blooded animals. Cold-blooded animals, um, reptiles are cold-blooded animals, and they aren't. They're usually, for the most part, slow-moving. They have they um, the way they generate um, heat. They um, that's why they they lie out in the sun more to get heat generation. They can't don't generate um, heat well themselves. Whereas the birds um, are warm-blooded animals. And because of relative biology, um, I guess around 1970 or so, they used the Deinonychus as their, um, their animal to determine that they believe that dinosaurs were, or a number of dinosaurs were warm-blooded rather than cold-blooded. So that's, that's an interesting fact about the Deinonychus. Now, what I'm doing this guy here is I'm adding a little bit of Prussian blue, and I'm doing a little bit of stippling to give some interest in the background. I do that a lot with my watercolor. Um, when you're laying down uh, flats of color, sometimes it, it gets a little bit boring, or you um, have some foxing that you don't want, and by foxing, I mean when the paint dries, it will dry in a funny fashion where the pigment will have little spider webs in it. And sometimes you really like that, and sometimes you don't. If it's something that you don't want, what you can go do is go back in over it and stipple a bit. Just do little dots with your watercolor and give it the shape adjust the shape that has happened that you don't want by adding a little bit of extra color. Now I'm throwing some green on the rocks because if you have um, any type of uh, area where you've got rocks, there's always going to be lichen or plants growing through the rocks. And by, you know, just having green on this edge, that would, it'd be rather boring and it'll, it'll throw an interest only in that area where that green is. What, what throwing a little bit of added of the color that you have over here, or on one side of the painting, on another side of the painting, it helps harmonize the painting. It helps give you an overall um, feel and interest in the painting, rather than if it was just on that curve there. It would um, be boring and it, it'll flatten it out by giving um, a little bit of that green and spreading it around across the, uh, the painting itself. You get a little bit more interest across the painting. Now, what to do with the Deinonychus himself? Now, we can do anything we want with him. We could actually make him 
the color of a peacock if we liked, simply because um, animals, when you think about it, if you've got a peacock in the jungle, um, that brilliant blue and green, mind you, will get lost in the general jungle because of, of um, shadows. If you've ever been to a zoo and you all of a sudden hear a peacock crying and you look around, you, sometimes you don't see it right away because of the foliage. People think that, oh, gee, the, this animal is so brilliant. Why, you know, lions and tigers or any type of or the ding, dingoes or um, I'm trying to think of some of the, the dingoes are in Australia. My apologies. Um, the... Uh, carnivores of, of India, like a dole. I'm trying to think what other um, jackals. I'm sure they have jackals in India. Um, basically would be able to see these birds and they'd be a major target. But um, number one, peacocks can't fly. Um, but number two, that the colors blend in better with the uh, background than you'd realize. And that's what happens to be with, with a lot of animals with um, what we think are brilliant colors, like a toucan. Um, you know, toucans are black and white with that brilliant orange bill, and orange and yellow bill. But even in it, the foliage, because of shadow and light, and also animals don't see color the same way we do. Um, we see a much greater variety of color than a lot of animals do. What I'm using right now is burnt sienna. Um, I've decided that he's going to be brown, but uh, more jackal colored himself. Um, they, when it comes to hunt, this this was a bird that was either a hunter or a scavenger. The reason why it's called Deinonychus uh, is the it, it translates to terrible claw. And see this claw right here that I haven't painted yet um, is where they get their name. Um, it's used for ripping and tearing. Obviously, if you got a big claw that you know that large, you're going to be using it on tearing things up. Um, when you think about it, it's like uh, roosters have spurs behind their their uh, feet that they use in battle between other roosters, but they also use them as defense. But when you think about the Deinonychus, it's got these claws forward on its feet, which give it a better idea that it was probably um, and most definitely a predator when it has, you know, the, the, the amount of teeth it has. Um, it also... If you do go go and look it up on Wikipedia, I put the information down below so that you can um, read more on it, more of the history of the Deinonychus and uh, what we know about it presently. Um, but it was definitely a predator. They don't know whether or not it um, ran in packs. They suspect it did. Um, but aren't sure, you know, again, everything that we determine about any dinosaur is from information that we can glean from bones, the fossils that it was found with, and um, how those fossils were found. And paleontologists use that information to make determinations on the um, lifestyle and behavior of the of the dinosaurs they find. So the thing is is that I'm painting this burnt sienna, but let's face it, he could have been any color of the rainbow. And um, I'm just thinking hawk. Um, I'm thinking predatory animals that I know. Let's say since since I'm thinking hawk, um, most raptors, for some reason, have slightly yellow bills. So we'll give him a, let's give him a, a f f yellow in the front here for his, for the heck of it. 
So the thing is, too, if you're painting dinosaurs, once you get the information on their bodies and their bones, if you look at the different ways that um, dinosaur painters and the people who reconstruct dinosaurs do them, um, the reason why they paint or draw their particular um, dinosaur any way they do is they're thinking in terms of animals that exist today and how they're camouflaged or how how they look. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to give this guy some striping like um, a lot of hawks have spotted tails. I'm thinking um, in my area the uh, owls have spots on their wings and um, I'm thinking primarily in our area the Cooper's Hawk has spotted tail feathers. So I'm giving him a little bit of a spotted tail. And like I said, you'll note that that brown's pretty dark. I think I'm, I will go back when I'm finished with this painting and I will detail up those tail feather, the tail feathers a little bit more to give it more of a feathery feel because the, the dark, darkness of the spots that I'm doing is covering up the initial detail that I did on the tail. And I want some of that detail to come through. So I will go back and tighten that up when I'm done. And right now too, I want, uh, I'm looking at his wings and I'm trying to decide if I want, I'm thinking of keeping them white. I'm ke definitely going to keep his belly white. But I think I will just give him, uh, not sure what, how we're going to finish these wings. We're playing with it right now. And that's the thing too, is that you can do anything you want with the dinosaur within reason. Um, I don't think dinosaurs were green. I really don't. You know, it's like we, I mean, when I was a kid, we used to have lots of green dinosaurs. And I don't even think there are many, that, when we th talk about reptiles, um, you have animals, but most reptiles are t have a tendency to be gray. Um, they, they'll have lights of pretty colors within them, but most, most of your reptiles have a tendency to be earth tones. Most mammals, too, have a tendency to be earth tones. Insects will get into the unusual and pretty colors, but they have a tendency to uh, um, mimic the uh, plants that they, they live on. So um, that's why you'll find, I, I, I personally believe that's why we have more greens in the insect world, whereas with um, the mammal, and the reptiles, we pretty much stick to earth times. You will have things like chameleons and animals, and I'm trying to think a few other, the um, turtles really aren't green. If you, you know, it's funny, we, we like to uh, depict them a lot of times with green colors, but you know, turtles are, are primarily olive to gray. Um, some of them are green, but for the most part, they, they're earth tones too. There's not a lot of, um, when it comes to fish even, you have tropical fish with blues and uh, some birds with purples in them. But most of your, your major intense colors um, are given to plants more than they are animals. I mean, when you're talking about your pinks and your purples and your blues, um, that that's more in the plant department. So if there's something that's mimicking a plant, then or they're trying to hide among particular plants or of a particular color, um, that's where that sort of color comes through. But as you can see, right now I'm giving um, some darker um, paint in here because it's like if the light was coming from above to give it some volume the dark would be on the edges here. So I'm trying to give a little bit of volume by adding a little bit more dark in that area. And I think I'm going to give the feet, I'm going to th throw the, the feet and that claw into Payne's Gray. So now mind you, um, uh, Cooper's Hawk, 
yellow feet. They have yellow feet. So it's like, I mean, I could have done those feet bright yellow. Um, lots of raptors. Uh, I believe the bald eagle has yellow feet too. So depending on, you know, again, think about what kinds of animals would hold a similar niche in the environment of whatever dinosaur you're, you're currently painting. And that would probably be, be close. If you, you want to be closer or you don't have an idea of what color you'd want a dinosaur to be, get, there are amazing books out there now. They're, they're constantly coming up with really good books um, on dinosaurs. And use somebody else's color palette. If they've come up with a uh, color palette that you like for dinosaur, use theirs. Okay, now we've got the general color down. I'm going to throw just a little bit of um, purple for shadows. And I'm going to throw it in the rocks and I'm going to throw it on him again to get uh, a variety and harmonizing of the color over the whole piece. Yeah, now, okay, there's a prime example of, I got too much pigment on my brush and I threw down that purple and see how dark it got so fast? This is where your amazing um, paper towel comes in handy. There, I'm blotting it back and you can see I got, okay, now that's more about the range I want. And again, from the amount of purple I've got on my brush, a little too heavy. So I'm going to blot it back. And the thing is, is that, say that dried, um, purple has a bit of a stain in it. Purples are not um, pigment. They're um, as pigment heavy as some of the other um, colors. They're more stain based. So. The pigment colors are actually a little bit easier to pull out than stain based. So you want to get, if you're going to get a purple too heavy, it's kind of best to get it out while it's still wet, if you can. Okay. Go in and get, and uh, mind you again, the burnt sienna is a, a warm red brown. So that, that cool purple. Oh, that's good. I pushed my animal there. <gasps> Drop my brush. Okay, there we go. And there we go. Even though he's white, I'm throwing the purple in here to give me my shadow. And that that the color is very light, but because it's purple, it'll turn the the form a little bit more. Again, that's really dark. Blot it. And then we've got that nice shape of shadow of the grass. Put a little bit more under his foot here. Like I said, that purple's coming down really hard. And what I'm doing right now is I'm sticking my brush in my water and getting basically washing the purple out of the brush. And there's still probably a little purple in there. But I'm using the just the water from my brush to ease up that purple that I just laid down. Okay. There we go. And that's basically it right there for the Denonicus. I'm going to, when this is dry, I will, again, go back over um, the pen lines. Oops, his eye. We did not do his eye. Let's give him um, a burnt sienna eye. Give him a little brown eye. Hang on here. Sorry. It's like, usually I paint the eye first, and it's like, okay, painted the eye last this time around. There we go. Okay, um, like I said, and I see one claw. On his, it's like little things that you're going, okay. I missed that. There. There. Now it's close to paint it. Okay. Again, um, what we're going to do after this dries, I'll go over it again in um, ballpoint pen and crisp everything up. And that's basically it.
that's our Denonicus um, D for my Dinobet. My name is Lynn Hunter, L-L-Y-N-H-U-N-T-E-R. Um, I'm on Patreon. Uh, I'm very inexpensive. You can you can sign up for my Patreon for a dollar a month. Um, and I try to post almost daily. I post videos. Um, I offer all kinds of digital uploads for people to follow me. And I have a comic book that I post um, one page a week for a steampunk comic called Silk and Steel. So um, come on over and check it out. I, I open a lot of pages to the public. And I post a video like this every week on my uh, YouTube. So thank you for stopping by. Thank you for watching. And uh, hope you enjoyed it. Bye-bye.